Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to this commemoration of the 200th anniversary um, of Boston becoming a city. Uh, so on May 1st, 1822, the, we officially became a city, um, and it's May 1st, 2022. Um, so I, uh, I'm Councillor Kenzie Bach. I just want to make sure the sound sounds a little, um, I'm just mic checking here. Just give it a sec. Are we good? Okay, sounds better. Um, I, I'm the Master of Ceremonies today, um, and I want to start by uh, inviting up Nathaniel Shidley, who's the Executive Director of Revolutionary Spaces, the organization which um, takes care of this beautiful building that we're in today, uh, and also um, the old State House uh, across the street. So, Nathaniel Shidley. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, members of the Boston City Council and of the administration, residents of the city of Boston and visitors to this great city. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Old South Meeting House this afternoon for this commemoration of the 200th anniversary, the bicentennial of the incorporation of Boston as a city. Our organization, Revolutionary Spaces, is dedicated to bringing people together to explore our nation's unfinished struggle to create and sustain a free society, evoked so singularly by the two national treasures that we care for, this building, Old South Meeting House, and the Old State House, just two blocks down Washington Street. Uh, both of our buildings have played a role at different points in time um, as seats for governing Boston. Uh, that the old state house was originally built in part as the seat for the town meeting, for the town government of Boston before it was incorporated as a city. Um, sometimes uh, when meetings of the town could not fit in the old state house or later in Faneuil Hall, uh, after it had moved over to Faneuil Hall, um, the town would gather in this building, which was the largest indoor gathering space in 18th century Boston to do the work of governing themselves. Uh, so as you sit here in this building, I want you to think about the fact that this building is a testament to, is a witness to the long arc of work by citizens of Boston um, to insist that their voices be heard in the halls of town and city government. When we come together as we are today to remember that history, we're not just involved in remembering our city's past. We are using that history as a touchstone for the unfinished work, right? The work of building a more just and equitable city for all of us. Uh, history can be an important inspiration it can be a reminder that we stand in a long arc of work, um, and it can remind us of the importance of leaning in hard to continue to work together to build a city that works for everybody. So thank you for being here this evening. I'm so honored to be part of this commemoration um, and to be with all of you here. Thank you. I now want to invite up my colleague, uh, Council President Ed Flynn. Um, the charter uh, that came into force in 1822, um, it both created the first mayor of Boston, and we will hear from that person's successor in a bit, um, but it also uh, created the first council going from a board of selectmen. So I'm going to ask Councillor Flynn to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Councillor Bach. And if you're able to stand, um, please stand. And, and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. And now, um, in a slight adaptation to the program, I'm actually going to invite up 
both of Boston's poet laureates. So um, we are very uh, delighted to have uh, Portia Ola Iola, um, who's been serving as the poet laureate for us for some years now. Um, and then um, we have our second ever uh, Youth Poet Laureate, who has just recently started, I think back in February, um, Angeliqua uh, Lenina yeah, Verona Burkett. Um, and uh, we're really thrilled that we'll be hearing recitations from both of them of poems about Boston. So we'll begin with Portia's um, recitation of Boston Ode, uh, and then we will hear um, Heart of Boston uh, from Angie. So I'd invite them. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. How are you all? Good, I feel so incredibly honored, excited, humbled to be here with y'all, um, thinking on the history of the city, but also um, the future of the city. Um, this poem is an ode to Boston. Um, yeah, and, and, and sometimes it, it fills me with so much um, joy, um, excitement, and I hope to give that and celebrate the city with y'all this, this evening. Boston Ode. Can you name a love without rigor, without sweet ache and stretch and sunshine and sweat? Boston, parent of our hollowed America, someone else's God before the land was conquered, not the city we are born of, but it is a charitable home. The same way in which the city upon a hill gave birth to a country and we are all now inside a nation and unbelonging at once. There is not a love I can fathom with neither push nor pull, with neither grit nor sorrow nor glory reigning out the other end. What is a home then, if unhinged and locked? Beloved city, gemmed with bodegas on its corners, each studded with a cat guarding the front stoop, gracious current, ringing the rush of the river, the calm of the pond, the guilt of the ocean, hushing secrets along Dorchester shores, Boston, the best to keep the cat. Slades on Tremont and Bintus and Rosendale. Home is the booth we plop into, the cafes where the cashier craft meals that fill us. Dear city, Southwest corridor thumbing from the subway, racing against air, patron saint of travelers, plague of trolleys, hold us still at lights, unlearn us bustle and hand us patience. Memorandum to slow. Remind us who it is we are and the blood love it took to raise a city of building blocks, place of clear water, of culture shaping, of planting and planning, tri hill city, tip the cup of tea and bring on the massacre, city of building up, 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 and people out, 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 city of ramming, city of running, of shifting, pacing, fast, gone, champion of all, parade for everything, celebrate the house, the keeper of our bones, nest, to our families, who will want if we won't, and what is a heart if it does not pulse? If it doesn't pull itself toward itself and extract itself away again, what is a heart if it does not pause? Then continue. As to remind the body it has chosen to keep going, the gallant and the trodden, the gentrified and the migrant, from Roxbury to the seaport, Harbo Castle Island, cobblestone tomb of chess, cobblestone town, 
always shouting our melancholy big on your pavements, always chasing friends away and further into your arms, sirened city, sunbathe, silly picnic, public garden concerts, you beautiful summer, you firework and worth it all, you cold heat to my head, investor and in wealth and health, eldest master, first future of our states, teacher of love, long standing, of might and fight and force politics and wind blow a barbed breeze, cutting kisses across the face. Oh, city I love. Oh, city I know and walk the lawn of. City I carry between my cheeks, around my neck. City I found along my palms, under my nails. City of song blaring, of loud leaping faith, rhythm familiar and inescapable calling out to each of us by heart, singing out to all of us by name. Thank you all so much. And please uh, show some love for um, our second ever, ever uh, Youth Poet Laureate, Angelique Linnea Verona Burkett. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me good? I think you can, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so I first wanna say thank you for allowing me to be here. And I also wanna say that I was super excited to meet Mary Wu, that I was really screaming when she came up to me. <laughs> and I called her cool. I'm not sure if that's like an insult or like if that's like okay coming from a teenager, but I hope you like being called cool, okay? Got thumbs up. So here's my poem called Heart of Boston. The first period bell rang and I snuck my way through the bodies of bustling, hurried students and made my exit out the back door, up the stairs, past Madison Park, and surprisingly quickly off my school's campus, corner of Malcolm X Boulevard and Tremont Street. 8.37 a.m. The traffic was still heavy with the 66, 21, and the 15 fighting cars for the road. Coffee stained white shirts and crumbs from a Dunkin' Donuts sandwich appear on the clothes of people late for work and upset with themselves for taking this way to work. The mass of students leaving Roxbury Crossing and crossing the intersection had quieted to only a few late stragglers and people like me either overwhelmed or unbothered to stay. I was at the Reggie Lewis Center and had just over five hours to kill before I had to be home. Huntington Ave and Forsyth Street at Richards Hall, 9.04 a.m. Allowing my feet to carry me, I find my way at Northeastern, standing in front of a boy with dirty blonde curls and a flute wearing a Berkeley hoodie playing the impressions. With such grace and punctuality, that precious love started to make you wonder if you deserved a young lover. He didn't have a hat or a cup or instrument case. He wasn't playing for money. He was playing to feel the air in his lungs leave and enter that beautifully crafted woodwind and for melodies to ease the ear, and the sound that played on my eardrums was passionate, intimate, like the lyrics to the song he was revamping. The 39 held his horn to alert a small sedan to get out the way. College freshmen sprint to their two early classes while juniors stay in bed until noon, but I still heard and only noticed that flattering tone. And when I had stood long enough, to witness two new groups form, my feet took me away again. Beacon Street and Charles Street, our Parkman bandstand, 9.53 a.m. This time I was on the orange line to Oak Grove and stopped at downtown and made my way around Boston Commons until I saw a woman with short hair and big hoop earrings and a white dress move her body like water like the shoreline, coasting and easy, pushing lightly off her feet to skip over stray shells and hermit crabs, 
Her skin glistened in ripples against the mid-morning sun. The sound of traffic and loud seagulls were no match for her bare feet against the grass, and her head pivoting with her shoulders and waist. The music in her ears gathered and she bowed. Starting a new routine on the tips of her feet, I left once more satisfied and whelmed. Cambridge Street and Highgate Street over the Massachusetts Turnpike, 11.49 a.m. An hour and a half walk and I find myself hungry, stopping in Cambridge at Roxy's Grilled Cheese for some fries. Truffle oil and a homeless man's dazed vomit surround the entrance. Calm sounds of diners and restaurants starting up and serving to construction workers and the girls in the dance studio next door. But looking down at my feet, I see nothing but overlapping color and pictures, from Bible verses to pulp fiction and equalizer quotes, to vivid portraits of unsaid names, to Scientology rants, to, gar to a garbage pile being molded into an abstract sculpture by someone covered in rags and a kind face. I was on the bridge of thousands, maybe millions of people to walk here and mark there. I felt like I was walking in the very mind of adversity until I got to the end of my feet and took me away. South Huntington Ave and Huntington Ave at 1.20 p.m. Five hours go, back, go by fast, and I find myself walking to Copley to get the E-train and get off at Brigham Circle to catch 39 to Forest Hills, where I met a boy with a notebook and a stress and cracking his knuckles and loud music with a rapid moving pencil, a writer. Here on the bus in front of me, putting his voice to lead and paper then kept away safe in the last few pages of the notebook with papers falling out and doodles on various pages. His mind gripped the patrons on the bus, a pregnant woman arguing for handicapped seating, high school students scarfing down pizza and fries, a more seasoned bus rider talking with the driver in Cape Verde and Creole, a typical Friday on the 39. Could be, could be a perfect name for his piece as eye contact was made briefly between us two with the knowledge, the knowledge that we both are artists who had been stimulated by the heart of Boston. Thank you. Thank you to both our poet laureates. Um, it's really important for us, especially on an occasion like this, to acknowledge that before um, Boston was ever incorporated as a city or a town, um, it was the land of the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapoag. And so we're joined today um, by Elizabeth Solomon, a member of the tribe, um, to offer a, a land acknowledgement and recognition. Good afternoon. We are gathered today in native space. We are gathered in native space and on the lands and waters of the Massachusetts tribe. I ask you to honor the lands and the waters of this place and treat them as something precious because they are. 10,000 years ago, Boston Harbor was dry land and we were here. 1,000 years ago, much of what is now known as the city of Boston was underwater, and we were here. 400 years ago, English colonists came to occupy our land, and we were here. Today, most of greater Boston is a major urban area occupied by others, and still, we are here. Here is where our land ancestors laughed, cried, loved, made music, practiced our beliefs, shared both food and knowledge, and made both useful and sacred things. Here is where we raised our children and buried and honored our dead. Here is where we interacted with people who came from across oceans. These interactions brought new things, new tensions, new ideas, new challenges. Here is where some of the visitors brought diseases that killed most of our people. 
leaving those of us who are left behind bereft. Here is where those of us who survived remained and continue to make our lives. Here is where English colonists began their conquest of the continent. Here is where our relationships with the colonists were built, destroyed, and built again. Some of these relationships were friendly and beneficial. Others were fraught with conflict, sadness, and loss. Here is where we used our literacy and our knowledge to advocate for our people. And here is where the language of our ancestors was forcibly taken from us. Here is where those who came to live among us saw land, resources, and sometimes people as commodities to be bought and sold. Here is where we maintained, sometimes in secret, our commitment to our own values and beliefs about the nature of the land, resources, and people. Here is where we made alliances, intermarried, and made new communities with people from other native groups and with those from other cultures. Here is where we continue to make our lives. Here is where we laugh, cry, love, make music, practice our beliefs, share both food and knowledge, and make useful and sacred things. Here is where we raise our children and bury and honor our dead. We remember those who came before us, and we prepare for those who will come after us. When indigenous communities in the United States gather together, they traditionally acknowledge and honor the ancestral holders of the land they are meeting on. Many non-native communities have begun to incorporate this practice into public events, both to honor the native peoples who belong to the land and to recognize that the use of the land by others has come as a result of the displacement of the land's original holders. But what have become known to the general public as land acknowledgments are ultimately merely words spoken, heard, and usually quickly forgotten. They cannot change the past or heal the wounds that the founding of this city and this country have wrought. So I challenge non-Native peoples and institutions to go beyond verbal land acknowledgments and to consider what it might really mean to honor Native space. Honoring Native space means acknowledging our inseparable connectedness with everything else in the world. It is knowing that everything we do has an effect well beyond our individual lives and that our na actions necessarily resonate throughout the larger environment. It acknowledged that even the very breaths that we take have an effect well beyond our individual bodies. It means considering our conduct with its broad consequences in mind. It also means that colonization of this place, it also means realizing that the colonization of this place was not something that happened and was completed centuries ago or that it is currently limited to certain peoples, places, or practices. The systems that resulted in the colonization of this land and its people are still in place. The colonization of this place and others continues, and we are all complicit in this continued colonization. We continue, sorry, lost my place. We continue to colonize when we build so many structures that we cannot see or touch the actual earth, that other living things are permanently displaced, and that rainwater must be diverted far away from the places where it lands. We continue to colonize when we ignore or discount the unique knowledge, beliefs, and perspectives of those who do not have the same backgrounds or do not have access to the education, vocabulary, or resources that we enjoy. We continue to colonize when we gentrify neighborhoods, not to improve the lives of those who already live there, but rather to displace their homes, their way of life, and their institutions, so that some may be more comfortable. We continue to colonize when we work, live, and study in small protective enclaves that separate us from the communities around us, 
we continue to colonize when we use a community's resources but fail to contribute to its well-being. We continue to colonize when, whenever we hoard resources for the benefit of a few. These acts of continued colonization are not limited to those of us with power, influence, or riches. This continued colonization is part of a bigger system in which we all participate. Colonization is not a concept. It's a way of being in the world that is dependent upon individual and collective acts of colonization, both large and small. And each and every one of us is a colonist. And lastly, it means acknowledging that wherever you are in the Americas and in much of the larger world, that you are in native space. It means understanding that the indigenous people who belong to that place have an ancient and inseparable connection to it. It means being mindful of how you interact with all native spaces and its peoples. May all that we do in native spaces both honor the land and prepare the way for all of those to come. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, next up, we're gonna have Professor Robert Allison um, from Suffolk University. Um, if you're in the audience today, you might be forgiven for not knowing all the details of the 1822 incorporation. Um, so Robert Allison, um, expert professor of Boston, as he is, is gonna give us a, a little bit of a summary. So thank you. Well, thank you, Councillor Bakken. Thank you for arranging a celebrate, a commemoration of an event many people didn't know happened. Celebrating 200 years of Boston's incorporation of a city, I mean, it's caused all kinds of questions among those who have been invited. Many who are not here, I'm glad to see many of you did come to find out more about this event. And for those who really want to uh, find out more about the incorporation of Boston, a week from Monday at the Mass Historical Society. There's a panel discussion about Boston 200 years as a city, 5.30 p.m. Boston in 1822 was about to experience a period of profound change. It already was the fourth largest city in the country, and over the next decade, that is the decade of the 1820s, its population would increase by 50% and the population was going to triple in the next 30 years. Just think about that tremendous change happening in this relatively small, compact place. And there already were signs of this change. In fact, a couple of years before, a mill dam had been built from the tip of Boston Common, roughly where Beacon Street meets Charles Street, to what then was called Sewell Point, which actually we know as Kenmore Square. This mill dam was intended to turn Boston into an industrial center. The whole story of why that didn't work is a story for another day, but that's a sign of the changes happening in Boston. Also, the year before, English high school had been started. As we all know, Boston was the home of the first public school in the country. And when was that school founded? 1635, thank you. I thought there would be more Latin people here. Did you know that, Mayor Will? Thank you. English High, the first public high school in the country, opened in 1821. So Boston had these moments, these anticipation of change happening with a migration of folks in and an industrial transformation of New England happening, and Boston would be the hub of that industrial transformation. And Boston was still governed by a town meeting. There were 7,000 eligible voters in Boston. The population was about 40,000. 7,000 of them could vote, which meant they could come to the town meeting. And this was in an era before sophisticated sound systems like this one. So unless you were sitting next to the microphone, you wouldn't be able to hear what was happening. And what was happening was most people wouldn't show up. 
maybe 30 or 40 people would come to the town meeting, and whatever those 30 or, four, 30 or 40 people decided would be the law in Boston. It was an extraordinary attempt to maintain this democratic system for those who could participate in this era where most people weren't going to get out to the town meeting, and even those who could couldn't hear what was going on. Now, in 1820, there's a constitutional convention in Massachusetts, actually held at Faneuil Hall, and one of the amendments to the Massachusetts Constitution would allow for the incorporation of cities, that is, towns to become cities, with a new form, a different form of government. Rather than a town meeting, which would choose a board of selectmen, a city government, which, could choose, which would be elected by the voters. John Adams, the venerable sage, and probably the American who knew the most about constructing governments, approved of this change at the Massachusetts Convention of 1820. So in January of 1822, by the way, one reason, there are different dates we give to Boston's actual incorporation, and as different events have been planned, this one, the one at the Mass Historical, we've debated what's the actual date. And May 1st comes as close as any, because this is the date the city actually came into being with a mayor and a city council. But in January of 1822, the town meeting petitioned the general court to give Boston a charter as a city. And the vote in the town meeting was 2,700 in favor, 2,080 against. Often we think in the past people generally agreed and whatever happened was what everyone wanted. It's important to remember that then as now, everyone didn't agree and the outcome wasn't always what everyone wanted, although we do live in a system where the majority governs. So 2,700 being a majority. I know the counselors here can calculate what the percentage was of 2,700 out of uh, that number. So the petition went to the general court. And the good news for Boston was one of the leaders in Boston in this move to incorporate as a city was Jonathan Phillips, who was president of the Massachusetts State Senate. And the moderator of the town meeting was Josiah Quincy, a Bostonian. By the way, Quincy was lukewarm to the idea of incorporation as a city. But the general court did approve giving, letting Boston have a city charter. And so it was created, actually drafted by Lemuel Shaw. And the city charter divided Boston into 12 wards. Each ward would have one alderman and four councillors. So there was a 48-member common council representing the wards of Boston, the people of Boston, and a board of aldermen, an upper chamber, and also a mayor and each of these officers, aldermen, councillors, mayor, would serve for a one-year term. Jonathan Phillips was elected the first mayor. There's actually a very interesting story about his election, but I've learned in my three years as an historian the things I find really interesting are not of great interest to the rest of the audience, so I will leave out that political skullduggery and just say Jonathan Phillips was the first mayor of Boston and he also concurrently served as president of the Massachusetts State Senate. He did not give up that post. We know that the state Senate president is often the most powerful figure in the Commonwealth, and we know the mayor to be the most important figure in Boston. Imagine if you could also be president of the Senate. That would make your life a lot easier, I suspect. And Phillips stepped down after a year, and I think we can trace the real beginning of Boston as a city to the election of his successor, Josiah Quincy. Usually when I talk more about Quincy, I'm always hesitant to speak too loudly because Quincy was known and is still known as the great mayor. I'm always a little worried that the current mayor will hear me say Josiah Quincy was the great mayor not a great mayor, but the great mayor. I know that, um, well, well, I don't need to say more about Mayor Wu, who will have a chance to speak, but Quincy really changes the city in a number of ways. 
ways that may not seem as profound to those of us who may like um, dynamic change, but he cleaned up the streets. He personally wrote tickets to wagons that were double parked <laughs> and told their drivers to move on. He also enforced a noise ordinance. The north slope of Beacon Hill had a lot of taverns which disturbed the peace of the residents of the north slope. So Quincy enforced the noise ordinance and patrolled the north slope of Beacon Hill to make sure that taverns weren't playing their music too loudly. He also took over the Public Health Commission, took it under the control of the city government and also took uh, the state controlled the building of roads. Quincy made that a city function. And Quincy also served as chair of the school committee. In fact, the school committee included the members of the Board of Aldermen. So Quincy had control over the streets and over public safety, over the schools, over sanitation, over the health commission. He ran into trouble when he tried to take over the fire department. And that, in fact, is why he only served six terms as mayor. The term was one year then, so the only mayor to serve six terms so far. And also, with the incorporation of Boston as a city, Boston was given a city seal, and we all, many of us are wearing it. And the city seal has two dates on it, 1630, the year that the Puritans arrived, as we've heard, and also 1822, the year of incorporation. And it has a Latin motto. I'm a little worried now that there aren't enough Latin scholars here to be able to translate Sicut Patribus Sit Deus Nobis, which is, as God was with our, as, as you were with our fathers, God be with us. The eternal prayer of Bostonians, that we will continue to be guided, not necessarily by those who came before, although we will take certainly into account their actions and their words, but by God, who will guide the city and guide each of us in the city we share. I was really struck by the poet laureates that not the city we were born to, but a charitable home. Many of us, like Mayor Wu and me, came here from other places to make Boston our home. Many others, like my sons John and Phil, and yours, Blaze and Cass, were born here and will make the city their home and continue to shape its history, preserving the past, making their own history in the city we all share, which we hope will continue for another two, four hundred years well into the future. Thank you all for being part of this, and thank you, Councillor Bach, for making this event happen. Um, up next, we're going to have Judith Allen Shaw, um, who's the president of uh, the Afro-American uh, Genealogical and Historical Societies, New England chapter. Um, we, we're really glad to have Judith with us today because um, as was just alluded to by Professor Allison, um, when only 7,000 Bostonians were eligible to vote in 1822, as you heard many of them didn't. And um, Boston at the time had a really um, robust, vibrant black community, um, which largely was not able to vote. We haven't verified if really none of them were, um, and we sort of hope some might have made it. But uh, we know that that political culture was alive and well all through the 19th century. We're standing in the church home of Phyllis Wheatley, um, even before that, America's first published black poet. Um, and so we really wanted to make sure that the story of um, Boston's uh, 19th century black community was here with us today as well. So welcome, uh, Judith Allen Shaw. Good afternoon. So, what was life like for blacks in Boston in the 1800s? To set the stage, I'm going to take you to history class. Tell you about three events. In 1780, when Massachusetts Constitution went into effect, slavery was legal in the, the Commonwealth. However, 
during the years 1781 to 1783 in three related cases known today as the Quack Walker case, the Supreme Judicial Court applied the principle of judicial review to abolish slavery. In doing so, the court held that laws and customs that sanctioned slavery were incompatible with the new state constitution. I go on to mention Massachusetts was the first state to abolish slavery, in but was followed by other northern states. Second event. The first of the Fugitive Slave Acts was established in 1793. The Fugitive Slave Acts were a pair of federal laws that allowed for the capture and return of escaped enslaved people within the territory of the United States. Enacted by Congress in 1793, the first Fugitive Slave Act authorized local governments to seize and return escapees to their owners and impose penalties on anyone who aided in their flight. There was widespread resistance to the, 19, to the 1793 law, which led to the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which had more provisions regarding runaways and levied even harsher punishments for interfering in their capture. Number three, throughout the 18th century, African Americans were connected to white churches, including Hollis Street Church, which was congregational, and Trinity Church, which was Anglican. George Middleton was baptized and married at Trinity Church. While many African Americans continued in their connections with these churches, conditions tended to worsen and not improve over time. In earlier periods, slaves and servants probably sat in the church with the families they served. After the revolution and after the end of slavery in Massachusetts, segregated seating became a more practiced norm. And by 1800, the number of African Americans in Boston had increased, as had exclusionary and segregation practices in churches. These factors influenced the establishment of the first independent black church in Boston. The African Meeting House opened in 1806 and was built by a small but powerful free African American community. The first African Baptist Church was founded under the leadership of Thomas Paul, but in conjunction with the white First and Second Baptist Churches of Boston. They built their meeting house on Smith Court and met there from 1806 to 1898. It was not only a church, it was a school and a gathering place for political activism and cultural life, having hosted many renowned abolitionists as speakers. The African school held classes on the lower floor between 1808 and 1835 <clears throat> until the Abel Smith School was built. A noted abolitionist, William Cooper Nell, was raised on Beacon Hill and attended school there. Those are the three events that set the stage for the 1800s. These events affected the African American population and to an extent, its sympathizers with a growing concern around the causes of slavery, segregation, and racism. All concerned will begin to champion a just and more equitable society as the city of Boston continued to grow. According to the 1823 book, Boston City Directory, which has a segregated section for people of color, there are 297 listings by head of household in the city of Boston. Most popular street of residence, anybody know? Uh, Belknap, which is now Joy. Common employment appears to be boot black, hairdresser, mariner, laborer, washerwoman, and waiter. Less common are preacher, musician, gardener, wood saw, and brewer. It is known that African Americans participated in anti-slavery activities. One such listing in the 1822 Board of Aldermen docket, an early anti-slavery march. John Harrison and Daniel Carter and I did not find them in the 1823 directory. However, 
Committee in, on behalf of the African Society requested Liberty to form a procession march through the streets of the city on the 14th of July next, their annual celebration of the abolition of slavery. Committee of African Society granted June for June in June. However, a meeting associated with this event would take place only on conditions laid down by the African Baptist Church on Beacon Hill. So there were contingencies, but for monies, any monies made would be shared, and that the, and the church would be kept in good order. The city directory does not tell us much about the complete lives of the residents. So let's take a look at one African-American resident in Boston in 1822, Thomas Dalton, was born in 1794 in Gloucester, Massachusetts. It is known that in 1811, Thomas began attending annual marches in Boston celebrating the U.S. law of 1807, affected in 1808, that abolished the slave trade. Celebrations were sponsored by the African Masonic Lodge founded by Prince Hall. In 1815, he was issued a Siemens Protective Certificate certifying that he was free. In 1817, he relocated to Boston, having begun as a boot black and waiter. Dalton gained employment as a tailor and subsequently opened his own clothing store. From 1818 to 1832, he was married to Patience Young. In the 1820s, he actively participated in the African American Humane Society, the Colored People Fund Society, and the African Freehold Society, and became a trustee of the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church in Boston. Thomas joined the Prince Hall Freemasonry Large, where he would eventually become the Grand Master in 1831. He co-founded the Massachusetts General Colored Association. With David Walker, soon to become a famous author, and with his book, An Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World, in 1830, oversaw the publication of an address by the abolitionist John T. Hilton. Thomas oversaw the emerging of the MGCA to William Lloyd Garrison's New England Anti-Slavery Society. Their goals included ending, ending slavery in the South and racial discrimination in the North. And with Lucy Lou Francis, who he married in 1834, he formed the Boston Mutual Lyceum to sponsor educational lectures for African Americans. As a founder of the Infant School Association, headed a position to establish a public school with equal educational opportunity for young black children. He became an advocate for school integration in Massachusetts. There are many forms of protest, particularly in use at this time, are petitions. And here's one example. In 1836, Thomas Dalton signed an anti-segregation, anti-slavery petition upon which are the names of other active residents, including Mrs. Lucy Lou Francis Dalton, Phoebe Lou Hoyt, the sister of Dalton's second wife, Lucy, and their sister-in-law, Dorcas Lou, wife of Barzelia Lou II. The Lou sisters are the daughters of Barzelia Lou, a free man of color who served in the African American Revolution and lived in Drake, Massachusetts. This petition illustrates that the participation of African American community in Boston was inclusive of both men and women. And we can see that there was much activity within the African American community of Boston surrounding the time of Boston's incorporation in 1822. This was a vibrant community that was constantly pushing the boundaries set upon them. They were, hard working, they were a hard working community that made time to fight for the educational and political rights. And so here we are in the 21st century. Perhaps we should take a page from these remarkable people. <laughs> Thank 
you so much, Judith. And in the category of uh, 21st century Boston black history, I do just want to acknowledge um, two former city councillors who are with us today, uh, Councillor Charles Yancey. And formerly a city councillor, as of one day ago, um, a formerly councillor, now Senator Lydia Edwards. Um, next up is uh, Darlene Lombos, um, who uh, runs the Greater Boston Labor Council. Um, and uh, we're so glad that Darlene could join us today. As folks know, um, it is May Day uh, here in Boston and um, ar across the world. And hopefully you ran into a workers' march at some point today. Um, but you know, given that the uh, founding of the city falls on that International Workers' Day, um, and given as uh, Professor Allison alluded to the fact that you know becoming a city was part of the industrialization of Boston and the growth of the um, labor force. We felt it was really important to have labor have a voice today. So inviting Darlene up to join us, and <laughs> and um, and I also I see in the back. Uh, speaking of Black uh, 21st century history, I also want to acknowledge my colleague, Councillor Ruth C. Louis Jen, um, a current Boston City Councillor. So. All right. Darlene Lombo, Secretary Treasurer of the Greater Boston Labor Council. Thank you so much, Councilor Bach, for inviting me today. And I'm so honored and humbled to be part of this program. There's such incredible speakers and such an incredible poet laureates, and oh, I'm just thrilled. But today is May Day. I have the honor of talking about International Workers' Day, a time when people from all over the country celebrate trade unionists and the labor movement for our contributions to the broad struggle for justice and liberation. Today, over 80 countries across the globe are commemorating May 1st and the legacy of workers' movements that have fought to make sure we are all safe, that our most vulnerable are cared for, and that are all receive the respect, dignity, and justice that we deserve. The designation of May 1st as the International Day of Workers is a source of enormous pride for the U.S. labor movement. It honors the 1886 mobilization of 35,000 workers, unionists, and socialists in Chicago who left work that day to march through the streets demanding an eight-hour workday. Police met this show of militancy by firing on the demonstrators in what we now know as the Haymarket Massacre. The courage and sacrifice of those workers sent a beacon seen around the world. Haymark happened at the height of America's Gilded Age, when unimaginable wealth made by workers was taken and hoarded by oligarchs who built powerful monopolies of steel and oil, railroads and manufacturing. These oligarchs fought hard to stop workers from organizing for dignity, safety, and a fair share of the wealth produced by their own labor. Against the power of these oligarchs and their corporations, it took decades of struggle before the first federal law enshrined the 40-hour work week. The vision, sacrifice, and achievement of the U.S. labor movement earned the support and respect of workers' movements around the world. We should be proud, but we should also be angry. This is no moment to rest when we find ourselves 136 years after Haymarket in another gilded age. We again have American oligarchs creating monopolies. While nurses and janitors and grocery store workers could barely get their hands on PPE to keep themselves safe while caring for the rest of us, American oligarchs like Jeff Bezos of Amazon were busy using the vast wealth created by workers to build himself a spaceship. Over the past two years, from Boston to San Francisco, tens of millions of Americans took to the streets to demand an end to the, <clears throat> to the ongoing murder of unarmed black people and to demand the fulfillment of the promise of real multiracial democracy. The largest protests in US history. While we do that, American oligarch Elon Musk drops $40 billion to buy Twitter so he can invite all the racists back on there. Like the oligarchs of old and the ones in Russia we hear so much about, America's oligarchs are still fighting hard to stop workers from organizing for decent wages and working conditions. 
Yes, of course, a 40-hour work week is an achievement. But now we are at a time when most people have to work two or three jobs to put food on the table. A time when companies like Uber and Lyft are gaming the system by calling their drivers independent contractors so they don't have to offer benefits or pay taxes. When Boston was chartered as a city in 1822, elected officials invested heavily in building infrastructure, roads and bridges and housing and sewers, all things that a city needed to grow and expand and take full advantage of the Industrial Revolution. Boston became one of the largest manufacturing centers in the nation, known for its garment production and leather goods. Unfortunately, these mills and factories were some of the most exploitative in our history, where workers, mostly young women and immigrants, were forced to work long hours in unsafe working conditions for very little pay in order to maximize company profits. But we know it doesn't have to be this way. With so much suffering and inequality in this, the richest country in the history of the world, we have to consider the other meaning of the term May Day. It's a beacon of distress, an SOS. We have an historic opportunity to make sure we rebuild our city in more equitable and sustainable ways. We must not squander this once in a generation opportunity, the largest investment in infrastructure that we have seen in this country since Boston was chartered as a city back in 1822. President Biden, USDOL Secretary Walsh, and his Women's Bureau Chief Wendy Chun Hoon, Senators Warren and Markey, Congresswoman Presley and Clark, they have done their part on the national level to make sure states and cities can access billions of dollars for infrastructure, to provide pathways into all this work for women and people of color, and to make sure environmental justice communities are prioritized for these resources. It's now up to our states and city governments to work with organized labor and our social justice community partners to make sure this money does not go into the same exploitative, unequal systems as they did back in 1822. It is our duty to forge a new path with equity at the center, with economic and racial justice and gender justice at the center, and with workers and our families at the center. The labor movement will continue to fight for respect and dignity in the workplace, for our families and for our communities. And we know our collective solidarity is on the rise. We are on the dawn of a new wave of organizing, and from tiny coffee shops to some of the biggest warehouses, worker power and worker solidarity is growing and growing and growing. In fact, I was just at a Starbucks worker rally right before I came here. Let's take the actions today that will make future generations proud. The best way to honor the Haymarket workers is to carry their legacy forward and to fight for that world we know is now more possible than ever. Mayor Wu, very exciting. And let's remember, especially on this day, May 1st, the International Day of the Worker, on this day when we are commemorating the 200th anniversary of Boston becoming a city. There is no dignity and democracy in society without dignity and democracy in the workplace. Thank you so much. Thank you, Darlene. Um, now you get me. Uh, to prepare for today, I went and looked up what Mayor James Michael Curley said in his 1922 inaugural address, which was the year that the city of Boston reached 100 years as a city. And I found Mayor Curley saying that we really need to cut the price of the tea, and also that the city intended to form a plan for future facilities on Long Island. Um, so clearly, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, but what did change 200 years ago when Boston went from town to city? Um, as you've already heard from Professor Allison, there were people who didn't want to see that change happen at the time. You know, Boston had, as we heard, only 7,000 residents who were eligible to vote out of the 40,000. Many of the propertied white men who did show up liked the idea of being able to be in a town meeting together, hashing out the issues of the day. Um, and as already referenced, the system of government excluded many black Bostonians, women, most workers. Um, furthermore, this highly decentralized form of government was preventing Boston from developing a purposeful program of important and ambitious public projects to match its growth. And it was really that deficiency that caused Bostonians in the spring of 1822 to agree to change um, to a city, which, as you've heard, happened officially 200 years ago today. Um, when I say important public projects, what do I mean? First and foremost, sewers. 
Before Boston became a city, it had no public sewers at all, just a patchwork of privately owned sewers, which meant that local citizens were constantly digging up the streets themselves to lay their sewers in, and then getting into conflicts over how much money the bigger private sewer owner was gonna charge them to tie in. It was a mess, literally a frequently failing mess of sewage in the streets. As an official chronicle of the city puts it, quote, it was an extremely primitive system for a place having more than 40,000 inhabitants and frequently a serious detriment to public health. This system could not last, and already in 1823, so one year after incorporation, the mayor and aldermen were authorized to construct all common sewers and to assess the residents who wished to connect with them. The sewers were municipalized with great success, the city spent large sums for better drainage, and greater efficiency was secured by the appointment in 1837 of a superintendent of sewers. Mayor Wu just appointed, and the council just approved this week, her first sewer commissioner. So mayor, welcome to the crux of the job. Um, there were other public health matters to attend to too. Just 10 years after incorporation, a major cholera epidemic struck in 1832, and the city of Boston stood up a series of temporary hospitals, just like we built out Boston Hope two years ago. When the city was incorporated in 1822, it only had one public park, the Boston Common. But the people already knew that they loved that one park, so much so that the 1822 charter has a provision which specifically bans any future mayor or council from selling or leasing the common. It should be noted this was partly broken to create the Boston Common Garage, a subject of great controversy many years later. It took becoming a city, however, for Boston to start building out a park system. In quick succession after incorporation, it secured first Dorchester Heights in South Boston, then the Public Garden, the Fens, Franklin Park, Jamaica Pond, the Arboretum, Wood Island in East Boston, and Marine Park in South Boston. It wasn't until the 1890s that the city started also branching out into constructing playgrounds, recognizing that children needed something closer to home than the nearest large city park. On the other hand, once we started doing public libraries, the idea of neighborhood distribution caught on very quickly. So whereas the first Boylston Street um, Central Library building goes up in 1855, by 1870 there's already the first branch library in um, East Boston. That was a pilot, everyone agreed it succeeded, and in the next two years they built the South Boston, Roxbury, Charlestown, and Brighton branch libraries. Public access to knowledge was something Bostonians knew that they wanted, as they do today. As you can imagine, it's a similar story on every front. It took becoming a city to figure out how to get Boston the water it needed, to start doing street work in a systematic way, as you heard under uh, Mayor Quincy, rather than at random based on which set of abutters wanted an improvement in their street. It was as a city that we first created a school building program, as a city that we cited the first underground subway line in America. Perhaps most shocking to me when I went to look this up, when Boston was a town, it didn't own any public bridges. Every bridge that you had to take to get into this peninsula, which was even more of a peninsula at the time, was privately controlled by some private entity, which might mean crummy upkeep, tolls, and gatekeeping. Imagine that, even just public access to the town itself wasn't guaranteed. I was thinking about that in particular because there's, a, there's this famous reference to Boston in John Winthrop's speech The you've all heard it, for we must consider that we shall be a city upon a hill. It was quoted by um, JF, um, JFK and many others. It's that sort of idea of Boston as a light to the world. Um, but in recent years, I think it's also become a shorthand for the Puritan's vision of a closed circle and elect a sort of specific, exclusive, self-governing group. And the town of Boston was something like that. But what I think is so interesting is that the scripture that Winthrop took that reference to a city on a hill from actually describes a city where the gates stood always open, a city with gates that never shut. And that's what becoming a city in 1822 really meant for Boston, that the bridges stood open, the circle wasn't closed anymore. Never again might you know all 7,000 members of town meeting Instead, the public became a larger, more ever-changing affair. The doors of Boston increasingly stood open. We can tell that story with statistics. By the time of the centenary, 100 years ago, when Mayor Curley spoke to the T in Long Island, in 1922, one-third of Bostonians had been born abroad. 
Another 42% had parents who were born abroad. Only 25% were born in the US to American parents. This wider people became Boston's public, the workers who built all these new public goods, as Darlene mentioned, and the public who enjoyed them. And that's what it means to be a city. We move beyond interpersonal trust, the people we know, the people in the circle, to civic trust, relying on systems built and maintained and improved by hands we may never shake. And we can't ever delineate all the members of that community of trust because someone could walk in tomorrow across those open public bridges and decide to live here and become part of Boston. It becomes an open circle of trust, committed to the creation and preservation of shared public goods for all to enjoy. That's what we inherit 200 years on as we celebrate the city of Boston. That's also what we need to pass on, hopefully for another 100 years and another 100 after that. And so now, allow me to introduce the custodian of that trust, the mayor of Boston, Mayor Michelle Wu. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'll share a little bit about what I know of the origin of today's event, which is that I got a text message from Councilor Bach, who said, hey, did you know the actual anniversary, or 200th, is coming up? I said, great. She said, maybe we should do something. I said, wonderful. She said, are you free on this day? I said, I can make myself free. Uh, what are you thinking? And then she sent me a memo that had been researched and documented with every role of every person. Cal uh, Council President Flynn and, Council and then Councilor and Senator Edwards were already slotted into roles in that memo <laughs> weeks ago. So we're all here playing our part, but Councilor Bach and um, everyone here has, played, has done so much. So please, another round of applause for our incredible steward here. Events like this are so important because in Boston, in some ways, we are so used to talking about our history as a defining feature of our city that we can take these annual milestones for granted. We, on the political circuit, are very used to every year the, the way that I know summer is starting is First Castle Island, and Sullivan's reopens in spring, and then there's the Pride Parade, and then the Dorchester Day Parade, and Bunker Hill Day, and, and up at the Heights. And so we, we, we recognize different seasons by the ways in which we're used to gathering to talk about and remember the events of long ago. But when you put it in perspective of not just the annual churn, but 200 years, the weight the solid, solemn chunk of history that we are still adding to today, it gives pause and gives a chance for us to really reflect not only on where we're going, but whether we're telling the right story of where we have been. And as we heard from so many speakers today, sometimes that story has to recognize that even today, even 200 years later, in many spaces, our presence, simply our existence, is still revolutionary. I had the chance to write my first letter to the future, just a few months into office, because at, on City Hall Plaza, we're undergoing major renovations, and we left a time capsule colleagues added different items and the various departments and, and different artifacts were sealed away. And there's a tradition where the mayor also writes a letter to future mayors down the line. And this was a lot of pressure for me, writing a letter to the next hundred years, just a hundred days in office. So I tried to do some research, certainly not uh, Councilor Box scale research, but I looked up the previous letters that had come out of time capsules already unearthed. We had one from 1830, then from the city marshal, because even just a few years after our incorporation, technically the marshal still 
carried more weight than, than the mayor at that time, one from 1930 and then one from 1981. And the very first line, the opening salutation of each of those letters really struck me. In 1830, the letter to future successors simply started, sir, comma. In 1930, the letter started, my dear sir, comma. And in 1981, the letter said, dear Mr. Mayor. And even the act of all the hopes and wishes and dreams that each one of those letters carried for the future of the ways in which Boston might continue thriving, the ways in which we might continue innovating and growing and changing. None of my predecessors who wrote those three letters ever imagined a world in which a woman might be looking at that letter and receiving it and thinking about how to steward this city moving forward. Our presence continues to be revolutionary in many spaces, and so I'm especially grateful for leaders who continue to blaze those trails. I have a print in my office hanging from Mayor Kim Janey. I continue to seek counsel from so many around our Commonwealth who break barriers every single day. And as we think about the large, heavy, deep challenges that we're confronted with now, climate change, the fragility of our democracy, yawning wide gaps across our city, the struggles that our school system and school communities have gone through. In some ways, for me, the most powerful moment is to remember that Boston has been here before. We have faced great challenges before, and through the activism of community members, whether they were reflected and recognized in those official documents or not, we have always come together to form a more equitable and just future collectively. It's in spaces like this where our shared heritage fighting, standing up, organizing for abolition, for suffrage, for marriage equality, for climate justice, continues to be how we break down the barriers and silos that many would have divide us. And so today, Boston at 200, I am incredibly honored to be here and to mark this occasion, looking back at where we have been, with eyes wide open, looking to tell the stories of those who have shaped every step of this process, and looking forward to prepare that foundation for all those Bostonians to come. And today we have a very special announcement. Are you reading the news? Or? Okay. okay. <laughs> we, along these lines, again, uh, with Councilor Bach's leadership and, and steering, last year the Boston City Council passed uh, wait, last year, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I signed it in January. All right. The last year it was passed, and this is one of the first items that I signed into uh, official ordinance law, a, a commemoration commission, which will help us prepare with specific representation and coordination and accountability for us to be on schedule as we're looking forward to a very important milestone to come. So I'll pass it over to Councillor Bach to tell us more, but thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for being a part of our incredible city. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just gonna, we're, we've run a little long, um, so I'm gonna seem to speed through these names, um, but basically, as the mayor alluded to, um, uh, her team's put together a set of folks to really help lead this commemoration work, and it's work that we anticipate will cover the 250th um, of the revolutionary uh, kind of commemorations that we're doing, but also really look forward to the 2030, the 400th of the city, and then identify dates in between that matter to our communities and think about how the city can play a role in commemorating them. And, and like today's event, um, 
really try to make sure that we're bringing in all the threads and, and having all Bostonians see themselves uh, represented in these and that we can help our, our tourism community recover, that we can get um, you know, really representative, inclusive curricula in our schools, trails, exhibits in our local branch libraries, really kind of do the history of the city well together. Um, so there's a number of folks from the city government who are serving in this, and then also a number of um, folks from our community. There are uh, uh, folks from the academic world representing a lot of different expertises. And so I'm going to just read names today because uh, we are running low on time and not give everybody their um, accolades. But we, we do look forward to having a first proper meeting of the Commemoration Commission, which will be a public meeting and will be an opportunity for all the commissioners to introduce themselves. Um, but I would ask uh, that for, I know some of the commissioners are here today, um, so if you are here today, uh, if you can just stand and wave when I mention your name so people know who you are. Um, so on the city side, um, we have Chief Shigen Edowu, uh, Chief Kara Elliott Ortega, uh, Drew Eccleson, um, our, uh, our ac Chief Academic Officer, um, Marta Creeley from Archives, uh, Joe Bagley, our archeologist, David Leonard, the president of the library, Reverend Mariama White-Hammond, our chief of, uh, of environment, uh, energy, and open space, um, Roseanne Foley uh, and Lynn Smilage, both of the Landmarks Commission, uh, Michael Canizzo from BPDA, Maureen Garceau from the treasurer's office, um, uh, Representative Danny Ryan, um, who is a member of the Boston delegation, but also importantly from Charlestown, which has a number of major anniversaries coming up. Um, from, uh, our sort of wider community, uh, Suzanne Taylor from the Freedom Trail, uh, Ryan Woods from the New England uh, Historic and Genealogical Society, uh, Dave O'Donnell from the Greater Boston Convention Bureau, uh, Colin Knight representing Live Like a Local Tours, and making sure we're doing tourism outside of the downtown hub, um, Jay Ash from the Mass Competitive Partnership, Dory Klein from our Boston Research Center, Jean-Luc Pierrite from the North American Indian Center of Boston, Brianna Allen from the Chinese Historical Society of New England, Leon Wilson from our Museum of African American History, which was mentioned earlier, uh, Nathaniel Shidley, who you heard from from Revolutionary Spaces here, uh, Jay Cedric Woods from the UMass Boston Institute for New England Native American Studies, um, Tatiana Cruz from Simmons University, Joanne Alacqua from the History Project, which does LGBTQ history, uh, Kanasoran Kid, uh, Wong Sh sorry, Wong Sharish and Ally. Um, from the uh, uh, Mass Historical Society. Um, he's the research director there. Allison Frazee, I know, is also here um, from uh, the um, Boston Preservation Alliance. Um, I am going to serve on this commission personally, um, representing the Boston City Council. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, the Bob, Robert Allison, who you heard from, um, from the Colonial Society, uh, and Suffolk, and many other hats. Uh, Caroline Goldstein from Mass Memories Roadshow. Uh, Claire Andrade Watkins from Emerson College um, and really bringing the Cape Verdean um, history uh, to the fore. Uh, Kira Singleton of, of Royal House and Slave Quarters, um, who's also serving on the state's 250th Commission. Um, uh, Jim Kloppenberg, an uh, uh, his intellectual historian from Harvard. Um, William Leonard, uh, a historian from Emmanuel College. Um, Ferries Gray, the Sagamore of the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapoag. Um, and then um, we have several other representatives that are uh, still being formally designated, but they'll be for folks from the Chamber of Commerce, um, from uh, the Boston Foundation, um, folks from both neighborhoods with historic districts and neighborhoods without historic districts, um, a hospitality worker, uh, and someone from our Office of um, Tourism, Sports, and Entertainment. So as you can see, this is a, a wide array of folks, and there's the legislation set up subcommittees so that people could focus on kind of some of the main threads of work. Um, but we wanted in this moment um, where we were commemorating to say, hey, we're hoping to do more of this. Um, and for everybody who is here today and has opinions about how we should do it um, and thoughts about things we should commemorate, just know that that work is, uh, is coming um, to the fore quickly. Uh, so um, our very last speaker, well, I guess actually, if I can ask for a round of applause for all the commemoration commission. I can't wax eloquent about them now, but it's really an amazingly powerful list of folks. Um, so uh, our, our last speaker um, I'm thrilled to have uh, presenting, and it's uh, Marwa Bakari, 
um, who is one of the Boston students who participated in something called I Was Meant For This, a project that asked students from around Boston to give speeches as the mayor. Um, so this is actually Mayor Marwa, who I'm inviting up. Um, and, um, you know, it really was a powerful project. I'd encourage you to look up all the student speeches. I know the mayor saw many of them. Um, and I think it points to the future, right? We've talked about the past and the present in this event, but we really want to think about what's the future of the Boston. Who are those people who we're writing the letters to who will pull them out? Um, and, I, and I think it's also wonderful that uh, Marwa represents our, our young Muslim community in Boston because we're just a couple of hours um, from the start of Eid, which is uh, the most sacred um, holiday in the Muslim calendar at the close of the month of Ramadan. Um, so it's uh, wonderful uh, to have Marwa with us representing the future of Boston. And Marwa, if you'd come and join me. Hello, I'm flattered that you have chosen me to be your new mayor. I would like to thank my mom, my grandparents, my siblings, and my friends. Without them, I wouldn't be here. Boston has always been a part of my life. I was born and raised here. I attend school here. Boston is my home. The people of Boston are the most hardworking and determined people I know. We have the best schools and hospitals. My main focus as mayor is education. As the daughter of immigrants, the importance of education was something that my mother instilled in me at a very young age. She would always tell me that education is the key to success. I recall sitting with my mother as she urged me to practice math problems, learn how to spell, and read tons of books. She would sit with me working on math problem after math problem, page after page of reading. I wouldn't rest until I got all of my problems right. Without the help and persistence of my mother, I wouldn't have become the person I am now. Watching my siblings go to school every day and hearing them talk about what they learned always got me excited and fascinated with the idea of school. My first preschool class was at a predominantly white school. We had endless amounts of resources. In a class full of blonde hair and blue-eyed students, I definitely stuck out, but I never felt any different than the rest of my peers. After preschool, I moved on to attend a more diverse public school. As I got older, I began to notice the difference between my preschool and the school I attend now. Not only because we weren't in preschool anymore, but also because the resources available to students were limited. This is the problem with our public school system. I watched one of my siblings go on to attend a private school in a white neighborhood. Watching the success of the students proved even more that the more privileged you are, the more successful you're bound to become. This is because the system we have in place sets certain people up for success while setting up others for failure. I noticed that the curriculum was very rigorous compared to the public school curriculum, which meant they're better prepared for college. I watched the students go on tours to different universities while the students at my school weren't taken at all. I would ask myself why, why the school system isn't fair. Why should someone who goes to a private school in a white community receive a better education than someone who goes to a public school and doesn't live in a white community? This is something I really want to change because your economic status shouldn't play a role in your education. Everyone should have access to an equal education. This should start by making the curriculum slightly harder so students have a better chance of getting into college. Academic resources should also be presented to students so they, so they know what opportunities are available. Students should know about programs such as Stepping Stone. It's a nonprofit organization that helps students starting from the fifth grade. Stepping Stone provides guidance and makes the high school and college process a lot easier. On top of that, it's completely free. A student's family plays a big role in their schooling, which is why educating parents on different topics and opportunities is very important. Parents will have access to people who speak other languages, so something as simple as a language barrier won't stop them from supporting their child. At the end of the day, it isn't the parents' fault, it's the system. Public schools should have career workshops, presenting students the variety of jobs, so they have an idea of what they would like to do. Students should be given access to tutors as well as counselors. I have always been a shy person, and it's difficult for me to participate when in big groups. Students should always feel safe and comfortable when they're in school. The best way to achieve that is to reduce class sizes. If a class is smaller, the student will not only feel better about participating, but there will be more individualized learning, so each student fully understands the material. We often blame every other person. We blame the teachers, the parents, the principals, and even the students. But whether we like it or not, it's our system that needs to change. As mayor, I will make it my duty to ensure every student is able to unlock their full potential because every student deserves a fair chance at success. As I like to say, the more you know, the more you can. Thank you.
Thank, thank you so much to Mayor Marwa uh, Bakari, and we're very grateful for you, to you. Um, all right, we are done, well, except now there's a procession. So we do hope that you will join us. It is an expedited procession. We are going to uh, meet right outside this building. We are headed to Old City Hall, where Senator Edwards and President Flynn will just read the first two sentences of the act that established the city of Boston. Um, and then we are just going to cut straight through the back City Hall Ave to, to Court Square um, and go raise the city flag on the plaza outside of City Hall. So it should be a, a short but exciting procession, and we are going to be led by the East Boston JROTC program, which is a fantastic group. Um, so please join us if you can. Thank you. representatives and general court assembled and by the authority of the same that the inhabitants of the town of Boston for all purposes for which towns are by law incorporated in this commonwealth shall continue to be one body politic in fact and in name under the style and denomination of the city of Boston and as such shall have exercise and enjoy all the rights, immunities, powers, and privileges, and shall be subject to all the duties and obligations now incumbent upon and appertaining to said town as a municipal corporation. in the administration of all the fiscal, prudential, and municipal concerns of said city with the conduct and government thereof shall be vested in one principal officer to be styled the mayor, one select council consisting of eight persons to be dominated the board of aldermen, and one more numerous council to consist of 48 persons to be dominated, the Common Council, which boards in their joint capacity, shall be dominated the City Council, together with such other board of officers as are herein after specified. Thank you. And now um, the JROTC and the Fife and Drums will lead us um, down. City Hall Ave, which is uh, this pedestrian path uh, off to our left, um, to a uh, new City Hall where we will raise the city flag. So I just ask folks to clear away so that uh, the, um, our folks can lead the procession. And then everyone
Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to uh, the Fife and Drums and to our junior ROTC uh, from East Boston for leading us. Um, we have two very quick things to do here. Um, in a moment, we will be raising the flag of the city of Boston, uh, which has that seal on it. That's also uh, on your sticker um, to, to celebrate the 200 year anniversary. Um, but the other thing is just, Madam Mayor, if you could come up for a moment. Um, we, we are presenting to the mayor this plaque, although really this is just a foam court mock-up of the plaque. Um, but uh, it is, um, the language on it, which in a moment I'm going to ask the mayor to read, um, is modeled on the language of the same plaque, which is in Faneuil Hall, which was put in by Mayor Curley in 1922 to mark 100 years um, of Boston as a city. And so this one, the 200 year plaque, will actually go here at City Hall. Um, but we are waiting until the construction project is completed to fasten it on. So that's why today it's a foam board, and, uh, but it will be a plaque in the same style as the one in Faneuil Hall to mark the 200 years. Um, so I would just ask the mayor to uh, come up and, and read the plaque into the record. Thank you, Councillor Bach. 1822, 1822 to 2022. On May 1st, 1822, Boston was organized as a city. This tablet commemorates the 200th anniversary of the event, May 1st, 2022, Boston Commemoration Commission. Um, and now we would very much appreciate the accompaniment of our uh, fife and drums if they were willing whilst uh, we raise the flag of the city of Boston. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the flag will be raised by the mayor and the councillors um, who are here, including Council President Flynn, um, Councillor uh, Ritzi Lujan, uh, city councillor at large, and of course our former colleague, uh, Senator Lydia Edwards. Thank you everyone. Happy birthday to the city of Boston. Here's to many more centuries ahead.